Good afternoon. It is my privilege to introduce the next presentation, Race in the Adventist Church. This important and necessary topic will be presented by Dr. Ella Simmons, General Vice President of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and Attorney Jennifer Woods, Associate General Counsel for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, we, we will hear about the history of racism from a global perspective and the impact it has had on the Adventist Church. We will also talk about what our next step should be as a church. How can we, as a worldwide family of believers, all created in God's image, have honest, open conversations around the topic of race and other discriminatory topics and move forward together? As we start our conversation, I ask that you open your hearts and your minds to the topic at hand. We will have a live Q&A after the presentation, and we will welcome your respectful and on-topic questions. And now I welcome Dr. Simmons and Attorney Jennifer. I think it's important to start this discussion by giving some quick definitions of some of the terminology that we'll be using. Let's start by defining the terms stereotypes, prejudice, racism, and discrimination. A stereotype is an oversimplified opinion or judgment, such as an overgeneralized belief about a particular category of people. Prejudice is a preconceived judgment or opinion. We tend to think of prejudice in terms of having an adverse opinion without having a valid basis or a sufficient knowledge for that opinion. Racism is one form of prejudice where someone holds the belief that different groups of people possess distinct abilities or qualities based solely on certain physical or biological characteristics and the belief that certain races are inferior or superior to others. Racism is just one kind of ism. Others include ethnocentrism, nationalism, tribalism, casteism, nepotism, and favoritism when it affects an individual's well-being or livelihood. Discrimination occurs when we act on our prejudices. In other words, it is the unfair treatment based on our prejudicial beliefs. Dr. Simmons, it's pretty well known that in the United States history of the 1950s and 60s, also known as the civil rights era, this was a time that many in this country were trying to address and combat the racial discrimination that was occurring and legally sanctioned. Growing up in the South as a child during this time period, I imagine that you have firsthand stories to tell about racism, prejudice, and discrimination, and the racial climate in our country's not too distant past. Can you share some of those with us? Yes, I'd be happy to. Unfortunately, I'd be happy to. We need to remember these things as we move forward. We should begin, however, with acknowledging that while there have been many significant advances in many places, racism in the United States and indeed throughout the world in its many forms has not disappeared, but rather has taken on new dimensions, new nomenclatures and codes. I have lived, as you said, through many eras. I've lived through Jim Crow and periods of denial. That is the false belief that racism has been eradicated during the 1950s. I've lived through the civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s, through what some might term a period of advancement in the 1980s and 90s, and into the 21st century, in which we have all had to acknowledge, especially as of late, that race still matters in the world, and injustices still target groups of people for harm. I remember most the demeaning and destructive laws and practices of the Jim Crow era that lasted into my teen years. Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalized racial segregation. The name came from a demeaning black minstrel show character. These laws spanned a period of time of about 100 years from around 1865 following the Civil War and the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which supposedly abolished slavery. It went right up to 1968, that is after I had graduated high school. Jim Crow laws were created to set structures and to keep Black people in their so-called place. They were to marginalize African Americans by denying the right to vote, hold jobs, get an education, and 
otherwise take advantage of the opportunities that this nation provided to others. Anyone who attempted to defy Jim Crow laws were subjected to arrest, monetary fines, jail sentences, violence, and even death. These laws were often called black codes. They were strict local and state laws that detailed when, where, and how black people could work, could live, and for, yes, working for little compensation. The codes appeared throughout the South as a legal way to put black citizens into indentured servitude, to control where they could live and how they traveled. They even allowed local and state governments to seize children for forced labor and established labor camps for incarcerated adults in which, a pris in which prisoners were treated as slaves. Many died in these labor camps because conditions were so harsh. To enforce these codes and laws, you won't believe it, but former Confederate soldiers, and I might add, Ku Klux Klan members were appointed as police officers and judges. Of course, this also set up injustices in the legal system. It is essential that we acknowledge that racism is not a societal anomaly of individual ideology or perversion, but rather is a combination of systemic structures and policies and laws that perpetuate inequalities and oppressive outcomes based on ethnicity, skin color, and other race-related or assigned factors with individuals acting within these constructs. So within this perspectival frame, I can share a few brief points. First, as I was about to enter third grade, my parents informed me that I would be going to a new school. To that point, I had no problems with that. I remembered that my friends, my white friends from our neighborhood attended that school while I attended the all black school, not within the neighborhood, but a little farther walking distance. Well, when they told me where I could go, where I would be going to school, I was not against it. It was closer to home and I, as I said, already had friends there. This was following the Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954, which after a few years had just trickled down to implementation in Louisville, Kentucky, my hometown. In the early 1950s, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, known commonly as the NAACP, began a comprehensive systemic challenge to segregation laws pertaining to public schools in several cities in the US. The case that became most famous was that of Oliver Brown, who filed a class action suit against the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas in 1951, after his daughter was denied admission to Topeka's all white elementary schools. At that time, even federal law imposed a separate but equal structure in education to keep black children out of public schools operated exclusively for white children. Brown's claim was that schools for black children were not equal to the white schools and that segregation violated the equal protection clause of the United States Constitution. The United States District Court in Kansas agreed that public school segregation had a detrimental effect upon the colored children, I quote, and contributed to a sense of inferiority, they said, but still they upheld the separate but equal doctrine. Then the United States Supreme Court in its landmark decision that was issued on May 17, 1954, ruled in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place as segregated schools are inherently unequal. As a result, the court ruled that the plaintiffs were being deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the United States Constitution, and specifically the 14th Amendment. So with this, I was to embark on what I felt was just a new adventure. <laughs>
My parents knew better, but did not want to alarm me that there were those in our city and neighborhood who did not favor my black friends and me going to the whites only school. Later, much later in life, I learned that some children had been physically harmed in other cities and most children, of course, experienced some type of emotional scarring. You may remember the published story of little six-year-old Ruby Bridges in Louisiana who integrated the schools there. Ruby had to endure racial hate language and threats hurled at her by angry white adult mobs along her way to school every day as the lone black child in her previously all white school in 1960. She had to be escorted to school and from school every day by federal officers for her protection. This happened after I started my third grade experience, but there were other experiences that my parents knew about. As I stepped out a few years before Ruby, this was the first day and the days thereafter with all oh, my pretty ribbon on my hair and pigtails with my little book satchel. And for those who don't know, the book satchel is the forerunner to the backpack. And my little lunchbox in hand, there were no angry mobs, but my parents did not trust the calm. I was surprised to learn that they had escorted me. Actually, they followed me to school each day for some time. All along the way, they hid from me so I could think I was on my own. They wanted me to develop a sense of security, of independence, and the courage in the face of fear to face new challenges. My third grade year was a good one, however, and I would say for the most part, this was because of my teacher, my dear teacher, a Southern white Christian woman who showed me love, made me feel valuable, and protected me from some of the uglier sides of the desegregation transition right into my own school. Another time when neither my parents nor my teacher was with me, a car full of rowdy, probably intoxicated, white teenage boys whirled around the street corner where I was standing and yelled obscenities at me, offering me $2 for something. At that young age, I didn't fully understand what they were talking about, but I knew it was not nice and that I was not looked upon by them as a person of value. I was not nice in their eyes. I never mentioned that incident to my parents or to my teacher. Then perhaps around the same time, I was to represent my sixth grade class and the school at the state and national levels in a photographic compilation of student scientific achievement in the nation's focus on science in the worldwide race to the moon. I was happy beyond words. From the time I received a little chemistry set for Christmas, I had not wanted to be but thought I was a research scientist. Now the world would see me as a scientist. The day came when the team from the State Department of Education came to our school to take the photographs. All went well. I was pleased with my accomplishment and my teacher was as well. But then a few days or perhaps a few weeks later, I was called to our teacher's desk and he explained that there had been a problem with the photograph and it had to be taken again. That was no problem for me. Then he went on to explain as best he could, obviously struggling, that since I was in the photo before, my lab partner, my best friend, would now have to be photographed for our class. She was white. The racism was more subtle than that of the carload of rowdy boys, but it was more devastating coming from my teacher and the leaders of our educational system.
as an 11 or 12 year old child, I knew the real reason was that a little black girl could not be the face of the school district or state. It was then and there, whether true or not, I learned that a little black girl from Louisville, Kentucky could not grow up to become a research scientist. A little scientist died that day. Racism in America and throughout the world has deep roots and is interwoven throughout entire societies, reinforced over time as in the United States executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. For example, a recent headline reminded that we used to count Black Americans as three-fifths of a person. The three-fifths concept came from a compromise agreement between delegates at the 1787 United States Constitutional Convention that three-fifths of the slave population would be counted for determining direct taxation and representation in the House of Representatives. Since many had determined that Blacks were less than human, this fit well with their worldview and survived over time as Blacks are subhuman for many decades, first openly and then covertly or subliminally. So with this, it was easy for Americans to accept the March 6, 1857 Dred Scott decision with Scott, a slave, losing his final fight for freedom in the United States Supreme Court that declared that all people of African descent, free or enslaved, were not United States citizens, therefore had no rights to sue in federal court. It affirmed and protected slave owner rights because slaves were their legal property. And then it was equally acceptable when on May 18, 1896, in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, the United States Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal facilities are constitutional on interstate railroads with implications now for schools, hospitals, and all public institutions. It ruled that legal distinctions between whites and blacks was not unconstitutional. This is why I began my education in a blacks only school and I was born in a blacks only hospital. For this reason, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, Elder R.T. Hudson, then pastor of the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church, led community pastors in successful protests during the early 1960s against substandard conditions in the Harlem Hospital in New York. They came with pleas for adequate facilities and services. The Brown case opened doors, but not all minds. Racism in America has been passed down through generations of mindsets, decisions, and resulting cultural contexts. As Ellen White observed once, men or people may have both hereditary and cultivated prejudices. Studies have shown that racism is often defined as individual prejudice, but in fact, Racism is imprinted in cultural artifacts, ideological discourse, and institutional realities. Historically derived ideas and cultural patterns maintain present day racial inequalities. This is true of the United States of America and other countries in the world. The atrocities of police officers and even white vigilante types killing black men and women in the streets of the United States are not new phenomena. They are the con continuations of discriminatory systems and terroristic strategies long practiced in the United States to subjugate black people, First Nation or indigenous people, and certain voluntary immigrant groups to majority control. We were reminded just recently that 
one of the last documented racist style lynchings or hangings occurred in Mobile, Alabama in 1982, not so long ago. Since the onset of the COVID pandemic, Asian Americans have been targeted for harm openly in the United States and elsewhere around the world. This was the case as well during the Second World War when Japanese immigrants in the United States were forced into concentration camps. These internment camps were established by the president himself, Franklin Roosevelt, by executive order. From 1942 to 1945, it was the policy of the United States government that people of Japanese descent would be interred in these camps. Before them, First Nation people, including my own relatives, were killed or herded off to and restricted to so-called Indian reservations. My people walked what is known historically as the Trail of Tears to tracts of land designated by the United States government called reservations for Native Americans to live on as white settlers took over their lands. These reservations were to bring Native Americans under United States government control, minimize conflict between them and the settlers who were taking their land, and encourage Native Americans to take on majority culture. These continue to this day. And although we're looking at what is happening today at this point, I'm wondering what you're thinking from your legal perspective, but tying this to the Bible. Jennifer, have you identified examples of prejudice in the Bible, for example? We always want to look to the origins for these kinds of things. Yeah, I think that it's important to remember that these concepts are not limited to the United States or even to recent times. Yes, we definitely find examples of prejudicial thinking and discrimination even in the Bible. The book of Acts, for example, tells about God working on the hearts of Peter and the other early Christians in order for them to fulfill the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations, and to be witnesses even to the end of the earth. Even though Jesus told his disciples that their ministry would not be limited to Jews, the early believers still had an exclusive mentality of us and them that left uncorrected would have been detrimental to the ministry of the gospel. In Acts 10, we see how God opened Peter's exclusive views about God's gift of salvation by sending him the vision of the sheet with the unclean animals. After the vision and his encounter with Cornelius and those in his house, Peter was able to explain to Cornelius and those with him that I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. In Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White provides the following about Peter's vision and his subsequent encounter with Cornelius. She says, how carefully the Lord worked to overcome the prejudice against the Gentiles that had been so firmly fixed in Peter's mind by his Jewish training. By the vision of the sheet and its contents, he sought to divest the apostle's mind of this prejudice and to teach the important truth that in heaven there is no respect of persons, that Jew and Gentile are alike precious in God's sight. Thus, without controversy, prejudice was broken down, the exclusiveness established by the custom of ages was abandoned, and the way was opened for the gospel to be proclaimed to the Gentiles. However, unfortunately, the early church still continued to struggle with this issue of prejudice and ethnocentrism. In reaction to Paul's success in reaching many non-Jewish believers, some of the leaders in the church allowed their prejudicial thinking to take root again. Ellen White describes their thinking in the following passage. She says, when it became apparent that the converts among the Gentiles were increasing rapidly, 
there were a few of the leading brethren at Jerusalem who began to cherish anew their former prejudices against the methods of Paul and his associates. These prejudices strengthened with the passing of the years until some of the leaders determined that the work of preaching the gospel must henceforth be conducted in accordance with their own ideas. Even Peter, after his experience with Cornelius, fell into the sin of bias against the non-Jewish believers. And Paul wrote about this hypocrisy in Peter's actions in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. In fact, throughout Paul's ministry, he emphasized the oneness of believers to combat the us and them mentality that we as humans tend to hold on to. In his letters to the various churches, Paul often stated how Jews and Gentiles are equal members of the body of Christ. For example, in Colossians 3.11, he states, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Also in Galatians 3.28, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Jesus. And in Romans 2.11, Paul, echoing the words of Peter, says, God does not show favoritism. Now, throughout the church's history, believers have struggled with the concept of oneness in God, living out the truth that God created one human race in his image and that we are all part of the human family. Unfortunately, the Adventist church has also struggled with this sin problem of racism and prejudice. When the Adventist church was being formed, it was in the midst of the Civil War in the United States. Many of our early Adventist pioneers, such as Joseph Bates, Uriah Smith, James and Ellen White, and John Byington were abolitionists, speaking out for the equal rights of the oppressed. They understood that racism is antithetical to God's character and that there is no place for it among followers of Christ. After slavery was abolished, Ellen White appealed to church leaders to reach the newly freed slaves living in the South. In the 1890s, one of her sons, James Edson White, built the Morning Star, a river steamboat to evangelize to Blacks living in the South. Over the years, Mrs. White would make statements like the following 1896 Review and Herald article entitled, Am I My Brother's Keeper? Showing her view of prejudice and discrimination within the church. We are God's messengers and he has sent us forth to work for both the white and the black race without partiality and without hypocrisy. We have no time to build up walls of distinction between the white and the black race. The walls of sectarianism and caste and race will fall down when the true missionary spirit enters the hearts of men. Prejudice is melted away by the love of God. Believers, whether white or black, are branches of the true vine. There is to be no special heaven for the white man and another heaven for the black man. We are all to be saved through the same grace, all to enter the same heaven at last. Then why not act like rational beings and overcome our unlikeness to Christ? However, over time, Adventists, conforming to the realities of the society they lived in, allowed racism, bias, and prejudice to infect the church. This led the church to adopting the practices of the larger society, such as separate places of worship and exclusions in church leadership and attendance at many Adventist institutions. For example, Blacks were restricted from being treated at the Adventist Sanitarium in Washington, DC. Blacks and whites were segregated in our institution's cafeterias, and many of our Adventist schools had quotas of how many Blacks they would allow to attend. Dr. Simmons, please share some examples of how the Adventist church began to look more like society at large in terms of race relations, instead of being an example of unity. Let's begin with an article from the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper of April 1, 1951. And I want to thank Dr. Benjamin Baker for doing the historical research for me to 
uh, find this particular item and several others. And I want to share most of this little article with you. It is so telling. The headline reads, Religion Fails to Check Jim Crow, Adventist Find. It said, prominent Seventh-day Adventist here found out on Monday that Jim Crow thinking knows no religious bounds. After a dinner in the Adventist vegetarian cafeteria in Tacoma Park, which previously had served whites only, they were told, in effect, not to come again. The cafeteria assistant manager said that their patronage might discourage white patrons. The cafeteria in question, the article said, is owned and operated by Adventists in the building of the Review and Herald. They switched and called it Herald and Review. There might be a message there. An Adventist publishing company, as they identified it, where the general headquarters of the Adventists also are located. The cafeteria specializes in vegetarian food, they said. The sign says the public is invited, but, said an Adventist official, I think that the group, that is the group of Black Adventists, which was out here Monday, ought not to embarrass us in this way. In the interest of time, I will just summarize a few more examples. These are taken directly from the minutes of meetings of the General Conference Committee and General Conference Officers meetings. And although I had a string of about eight or 10 that would show the progression of this thinking, I could only pull out a bit here. And I think it will still help us to understand where our church was at this time. I want to go all the way back to September 22, 1918 to lay the foundation with the meeting of the General Conference Committee. It met in joint meeting with the Review and Herald Board, and they came together to discuss the topic of the cafeteria. The minutes indicate the purpose of the meeting was to consider the establishment of a cafeteria in Tacoma Park for the benefit of workers at the Review and Herald and the General Conference. Then we move from there quickly, fast forward to 1941, August 13, General Conference officers met regarding a letter to a certain Miss Watlington. And I want to share uh, the language directly from the minutes. The record says, I quote, Miss Watlington is a colored stenographer that we have agreed to call to connect with the General Conference Office to work for G.E. Peters. He was then director of the Black work. Brother Cobbin, had prepared a letter addressed to her explaining, it says, regarding a call, her work, and conditions here in Washington, with particular reference to the noonday meal, and the fact that she might have to bring a lunch since the cafeteria is not serving colored people. Then we move on to 1949. Uh, I know combine two meetings here if I can quickly. Uh, these were related meetings of the General Conference Committee and the Review and Her Herald on the same topic, the cafeteria, February 27 and then March 11. They came together to study the policy with respect to patronage in the cafeteria. And there was language here that says, Colored attendance coming at the time of the President's Council, the Review and Herald Centennial, and the spring meeting of the General Conference Committee might be problematic. You see, they were concerned that large groups of Black people, workers now in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and other faithful members would be coming for these meetings, and they did not want problems. It goes on to speak of their agreement by consensus that the cafeteria should have as its priority purpose to serve all workers 
of Seventh-day Adventist institutions, workers from the field, and students from the seminary, regardless of color or race. That was 1949. But still, in 1951, there were those in charge who sought to keep Black Adventists out of the GC cafeteria. In the little book, The Southern Work, from which Jennifer has already quoted, I want to emphasize and even repeat some of what she has shared with us. Ellen White says there, again and again, men have devised plans whereby to keep up the line of separation and still bring the colored race within the influence of the gospel. But the Lord has blown upon the effort and made it of none effect. She urges, we have no time to build up walls of distinction between the white and black race. The white people who embrace the truth in, sub, in the Southern field, if converted to God, will discern the fact that the plan of redemption embraces every soul that God has created. The walls of sectarianism, I repeat, and caste and race will fall down when the true missionary spirit enters the heart of men, of people. She says, prejudice is melted away by the love of God. She recounted that in one place, the proposition was that a curtain should be drawn between the colored people and the white people in church service and other places, I presume. She said, I ask, what would Jesus do? This grieves the heart of Christ. She said, the color of the skin is no criterion as to the value of the soul. By the mighty cleaver of truth, we will have been quarried out from the world. She said, God has taken us all classes, all nations, all languages, all nationalities, and brought us into his workshop to be prepared for his temple. Another example I can share with you that probably has escaped the attention of very few became world news. The article read, a Protestant clergyman and his son, a physician, were convicted yesterday of genocide and sentenced to prison by the United Nations Tribunal dealing with the Rwandan killing frenzy of 1994, in which members of the Hutu gangs killed an estimated 800,000 minority Tutsi and moderate Hutu over a three month period. This is horrific, but I dare say for Adventists, the rest of the article perhaps was equally horrific. It reported that the 78 year old former head of the Seventh day Adventist Church in Western Rwanda was sentenced to 10 years in prison for aiding and abetting genocide. His 45-year-old son, who worked at the church's hospital, it said, received a total sentence of 25 years for the same charges and for shooting two people to death. With the verdict, the former Adventist church leader, the article said, became the first clergyman to be convicted of genocide by the International Tribunal, which began in September 2001. The report said that this conviction has drawn new attention to the role of the Christian churches during the massacre. Jesus defied the social order of his day. He moved beyond behavioral parameters defined by religiosity. He broke down prejudicial walls that prescribed acceptable spheres of relationships, and he directly addressed the sins of racism in its many forms. The accepted norms of his day did not limit him. In fact, the Bible tells us they drove him to Samaria. We find this in John 4. And there he kept a divine appointment with the one we call the Samaritan woman or the woman at the well. 
in that meeting, Jesus modeled for us love in action, also known as justice or righteousness, that broke down both individual and systemic barriers to the love to which he has called his disciples. Jesus overcame national prejudices, racial prejudices, ethnic prejudices, tribal prejudices, gender prejudices, social class prejudices, religious prejudices, and historical prejudices in that meeting as our model. Let me take a moment to share what I have learned from my own study and firsthand from our colleagues, our brothers and sisters from around the world. Back in September at the General Conference Leadership Conference, which is held regularly at the General Conference Office for General Conference officers and staff, and then um, the these, these same group presented again in October at the Annual Council. This small group was asked to present little papers on racism, caste, tribalism, and so forth from our various divisions, from our own backgrounds, our experiences. I've already shared a bit about the United States from my personal experience and research. But here's what some others had to share, and you will hear the similarities in regard to racism in its various forms. Dr. Linda Coe, who is director of the General Conference Children's Ministries Department, presented under the title, Ethnic Tensions and Conflicts in China and Southeast Asia. She said, countries in Southeast Asia and China have been marked by ethnic and racial tensions and conflicts for decades. She said, conciliation, resolution, and a return to ethnic harmony have proved difficult through the years. She meticulously outlined forms of racism in at least six countries as examples. Dr. Ko said of the People's Republic of China that while you will not witness racial violence on the streets typically, discrimination and oppression do exist and impact the lives of dozens of ethnic and minority groups among the 56 ethnic groups in the country. She reported that the Human Rights Watch estimated that up to a million of one group may have been and perhaps still are being held involuntarily in extra legal detention in China's far western Xinjiang province. Many Chinese groups live with restricted movement and involuntary family planning. In addition, she showed that the Chinese discriminate against Africans within their borders, often linking them to violent crimes in the media, paying them less than their white colleagues for the same jobs, turning them away from taxis, restaurants, and shops, and further, under the COVID-19, discriminating against Africans by forcing them to get tested and to self-quarantine. Or she says landlords have evicted African residents, forcing them to sleep on the streets with hotels, shops, and restaurants, refusing service to them. Dr. Cole pointed out several racially or ethnically motivated discriminations in Myanmar which is in the news even now. She showed that the Council on Foreign Relations reported that ethnic and territorial conflicts have escalated since 2017. She said that discrimination there involves no voting rights, no citizenship rights, boycotting of Muslim shops, restrictions on marriage, family planning, education, and freedom of movement. Dr. Ko reported uh, from Thailand, she said that there are three levels of society that some ethnic groups, especially the Northern Highlands indigenous groups have not been granted Thai citizenship. Thus, she reported that they have no access to state resources such as health and education with imposed restrictions on freedom of movement and denial of land rights claims. 
In Indonesia, she showed that there is religious intolerance, sometimes culminating in violence against religious and gender minorities with denials of cultural festivals and celebrations, with political and economic turmoil and violence against these minorities. Dr. Ko showed that in Malaysia, there are points of contention. She pointed out the ethnic Malay, Chinese and Indian groups uh, related to differences in vernacular education and civic policies were in conflict, that uh, these structures for preferential policies for some people over others in education, employment, and business were evidence of racism and other forms of discrimination. Dr. Ko shared that the British Broadcast Company News reported in 2012 that the longest ethnic conflict in the Philippines is between the Moral Islamic Liberation Front, the MILF, of Mindanao, often darker colored people, and the government. She said, at the heart of the conflict lies deep-rooted prejudices against minority Muslim and indigenous populations. Then she shared information on Vietnam, indicating racism that has been mainly directed by the minority group against minorities, resulting in prejudice and inequality, and the labeling of indigenous and minority people as backward and undeveloped, with the government confiscating their land as they struggle to find a voice amid a population explosion. Then Elder Jeffrey Mbwana, General Conference General Vice President, reported on ethnocentrism and tribalism in Africa. He established that Africa is not one homogeneous country, but rather a large continent with over 3,000 different tribes that can and are grouped into several major ethnic groups who speak more than 2,100 different languages. He showed how Africans have organized themselves into some major kingdoms and many smaller chieftains. He said most of these did not have clear demarcations of borders until the onset of the scramble for Africa, African land, with the continent being divided into various nationalities by colonizers. Elder Mbwana reported that much of the longstanding African human relations issues are caused by several other factors like competition for material resources, land and boundaries now, migrations of communities and the like. He asserted that the coming of colonization, however, aggravated the situation in an attempt to divide, conquer, and rule. It also introduced two other elements of racism and nationalism, he said. He cited examples and illustrated negative effects of extreme forms of ethnocentrism and tribalism, including false conclusions about different people groups, divisions in communities where people live or serve together that stem from embracing negative beliefs about others and setting one's own group as superior. He cited serious conflicts and even civil unrest and wars, such as the extreme examples of ethnic cleansing struggles in the Burundi and Rwanda genocides of 1992 and 1994. And he also mentioned 1997, 2007 and 2008, the continuation. He mentioned skewed justice and fairness, encouraging favoritism, which he said, leads to serious large-scale violations of rights based on origin, gender, language, and even religion. He mentioned divided families and people being uprooted from their community, becoming refugees as a result of this discrimination, this tribal conflict. And 
he sort of tied it together with what he called blind and limited perspectives in the sense of seeing your own way as being the only way. And then Dr. Nelu Bersia, Associate Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, spoke on the multiple faces of racial discrimination in Europe and focused on the Roma people. He said, for centuries, the Roma people have faced widespread discrimination, high levels of racism, and horrific persecution that culminated in the Holocaust, a Roma Holocaust, which is the highest point of persecution in their history. Dr. Bersea noted that the hard situation of extreme poverty in which millions of Roma people find themselves today is not just for a lack of financial resources, unemployment, or precarious housing conditions, he said, but it is the result of a long history of exclusion from access to social services, lack of access to education, human rights violations, especially racial violence and discrimination, which have substantially increased their social marginalization. He reported that the biggest problem they face is their state of chronic exclusion. He shared that although today racism towards most ethnic minority groups in Europe is less and less expressed, at least in public spaces, and it is seen as unacceptable by the majority of people, he said the Roma people frequently still endure racist attacks. Despite the progress made in recent years, prejudices against Roma are widespread and deeply rooted. He reported issues that have been identified as priority for the largest ethnic groups in Europe, including, these are their points for action, combating hate speech, promoting and enforcing human rights and inclusive education, preventing segregation in housing and eliminating obstacles to the freedom of movement of Romani people in the context of international migration. Dr. Basea declared that the difficult situation facing the Roma people today is the imprint left by hundreds of years of hatred, segregation, racism, isolation, and marginalization. Attorney Bettina Krauss, who is also an associate director for public affairs and religious liberty and is director of government, government affairs for the church, spoke from her personal experiences, observing from her own life and uh, there in Australia as a perceptive citizen and then studying national dynamics as a trained attorney. She noted that the early 21st century waves of immigration to Australia were actually governed by the so-called white Australia policy. She described the policy as an approach to immigration that excluded anyone from a non-European heritage. She said the system remained until the late 1960s. Later at law school, she learned about the law of terra nullius, which literally means nobody's land. She noted that this allowed a whole category of restrictive law around Aboriginal or indigenous people land rights and was a part of Australian law until 1992. She reported that early British explorers believed Australia was theirs to claim for the British crown because it was, after all, terra nullius, nobody's land. But she said, actually, it was somebody else's land. The indigenous people of Australia had occupied the land for thousands of years before the arrival of European settlers. They had their own cultures, customs, and laws. Yet she shared 
that from the time the Europeans arrived until today, indigenous Australians have been pushed into the margins of society. She said they have become the, in quotes, invisible Australians, locked out of the comfortable prosperity of Australian society through a history of what she termed unrelenting discrimination and episodes of violence, at times amounting to what only can be called genocide. She presented her birthplace, the little island of Tasmania, as an example. She reported that within seven decades of British settlement, the indigenous population of Tasmania dropped from an estimated 13,000 to just one full-blood Aboriginal woman, citing the causes as the introduction of disease, government policies, and violence. He shared that in mainland Australia, indigenous family structures were torn apart by a program of forced assimilation leading to the tragedy of what's become known as the stolen generations. Mrs. Krauss showed that under these laws, up until 1970, many indigenous children, an estimated 300,000, which is a large number for that country, were forcibly taken from their families. In this process, the ruling classes applied a policy known as the brown bag test. Hmm, the brown bag test. You see, if children's skin color was lighter than a brown paper bag, they were removed from their Aboriginal families and assimilated with white families. Attorney Cross observed that today, many Australians are beginning to acknowledge their history of oppression. But she said, structures of racism in society persist with their impact evident in all aspects of life, educational, economic, and social. She noted that the effects of racism can be seen in the justice system, which has proven to fail indigenous people in many ways over time. She reported that since 1991, for example, more than 430 aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders have died while in custody, yet no convictions have resulted from their cases. She revealed that the impact of racism is evident in horrendous public health statistics, such as the life expectancy gap of 10 years between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. She reported that half of Aboriginal men and more than a third of Aboriginal women die before age 45. And she turned specifically to our church in Australia and noted that the historical record is mixed. She said on one hand, in the early 20th century, Australian Adventists began a very active mission, education and humanitarian work among indigenous people. In an article published in 1901, one Adventist writer said Australia's treatment of its indigenous people was, quote, a foul blot that needed to be removed. Yet, she said, on the other hand, the record also shows, as she recounted, that the church has not always been immune to the attitudes of racism that have become embedded within Australian culture. She verified that the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists notes that when a formal Australia-wide ministry for Indigenous people was established in 1980, some leaders opposed it, with at least one voicing the belief, and she quotes, that Indigenous Australians were beyond redemption. Today, there is an Australian Union Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Ministries Department that is headed by an Indigenous Australian. Some progress. Elder Stanley Panaya of the General Conference 
accounting services presented on various aspects of the caste system in India. We have learned from various reports that the least challenged racism remains that of Indian caste. That system, which was created to preserve Indo-Aryan racial purity. The caste system is now an element of Hinduism, literally in the form of a color system. Darker skinned people are outcasts or untouchables in the system. And to be untouchable means denial or restriction of access to public facilities such as wells for water, schools, roads, post offices, and courts, and so forth. Denial or restriction of access to temples where their presence is said to pollute the deity and the higher caste worshipers. Exclusion from learning sacred books of Orthodox Hinduism and exclusion from honorable and profitable employment with relegation to dirty or menial occupations, residential segregation outside villages, denial of services provided by, for example, barbers, laundry people, restaurants, shops, and theaters, restrictions on the use of goods providing comfort or luxury, like riding on horseback or bicycles, using umbrellas, footwear, wearing gold or silver ornaments, requirements of defense in forms of address, language, sitting and standing in the presence of higher caste, restrictions on movement, restrictions from roads and streets within prescribed distances of the houses or persons of higher caste, required unremunerated labor for the higher caste, in the performance of menial services for them. Pollution and purification, the record shows, are key concepts of the caste system. They are based on Hindu beliefs that each caste group can maintain its status by restricting contact with the polluting effects of the lower caste. Caste members customarily marry only members of their own caste. Recently, in the Global Mission Issues Committee, Amy Witsett orchestrated a series of docudrama type skits, that is a dramatization that presents authentic situations in which a variety of people describe their experiences with racism in its various forms. One of these dealt with the conversion of a brown-skinned Indian man to Christianity and his decision to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In summary, in this vignette, the man is surprised by several differences between his religious or spiritual system and his newly found faith home. However, the capstone, the bottom line, the, the last straw of the story came as the man was leaving his Seventh-day Adventist church service one Sabbath. He paused at the exit to greet the pastor and to seek to request his assistance in finding a husband for his daughter from among his new church family. The man went away sad when upon agreeing to assist him, the pastor asked, what is your caste? Many go away sad when after joining the Adventist church, they discover that the church has allowed the practice of caste, racism, clanism, ethnocentrism, favoritism, nationalism, and so forth, whether consciously or subconsciously. We have a responsibility to be conscious, to be vigilant about these things. We, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, must do all in our power to distinguish ourselves and the church from the legacy of what I would call biblicized bigotry, from the ingrained history of racism and separation that have been perpetrated on the world by Christianity and other world religions to placate racists in their efforts to maintain illusions of racial or ethnic supremacy, social control and economic advantage over other people of the world. We are people of the word, so, we should strive with all resources and heart to distinguish ourselves from that form of Christianity.
We do so by proclaiming the true word and more so by living the true word of Christ. At the height of overt racism, Christian leaders taught and preached from pulpits that there exists a racial hierarchy established by God and sustained by the wisdom of scripture. For example, James Thornwell, in one of his most famous sermons on slavery, said, as long as that African race in its comparative degradation coexists side by side with white, bondage is its normal condition. He taught that the relation of master and slave stands on the same foot with the other relations of life. In itself, he said, it is not inconsistent with the will of God. It is not sinful. The Christian scriptures not only fail to condemn, he said, they as distinctly sanction slavery as any other social condition of man. Thornwell was not alone in his teaching of these sentiments. His view was the dominant view in Europe and America for centuries. Proponents of slavery even use what is called a slave Bible. They use the Bible in general to justify slavery, but they used an adulterated version of the Bible entitled Parts of the Holy Bible Selected for the Use of Negro Slaves in the British West India Islands known in short as the slave bible it is the bible that british missionaries used to convert and educate the slaves in the caribbean islands three years or so following the successful haitian slave revolt the slave bible was printed first in 1807 in london for the organization known as the society for the conversion of negro slaves Three copies of the Slave Bible are known to exist today. It contains only 14 books, down to about 10% of the Old Testament and 50% of the New. It is reported that of the 1,189 chapters of the Standard Bible, only 232 remain. The rest have been deleted to eliminate passages that motivate slave rebellion or hint of equality of all people. Some of those deleted uh, passages are Galatians 3.28 that teaches there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female for you all are one in Christ Jesus. On the other hand, Ephesians 6.5 was retained and emphasized as it says, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey christ oh moses leaving the slaves to freedom was dropped of course but joseph as a servant a faithful servant slave in egypt was retained discussions of the slave bible remind us that time and place really shape how people encounter the bible people don't look at the Bible or approach the Bible or read the Bible in a vacuum, research has shown. They're shaped by their social and economic context. Frederick Douglass is quoted as saying, between the Christianity of this land and Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference, so wide that to receive one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. Dr. Ganun Diop, the General Conference Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, spoke at the leadership conference that I mentioned earlier on God's perspective on race and racism. He said, we are a church, a faith organization, more specifically a Christian faith that trusts in the revelation of God in scripture and Jesus being the great center of attraction. He said, we need God's insights as we face the pandemics 
of racism, tribalism, ethnocentrism, casteism, clanism, classism, and any supremacist ideology and practice. He characterized the topic racism and discrimination as part of the great controversy. He pointed out that Bible, the Bible shows that the root of racism was sown in heaven with the pride and prejudice of Lucifer, Satan against the Son of God. Lucifer asserted himself in the quest for dominion over angels. This was what precipitated the fall of Lucifer, he said, along with one third of the angels who followed him. And we find the account of this in Revelation 12. He declared that pride and prejudice inspire racist mindsets and behaviors, and that pride and prejudice lead to violence and find a harbor in unregenerated hearts. And he referred us as a people to read Ezekiel 28. Well, as we look at this, we know that most of us don't consider ourselves racist. Could you share a bit with us, Jennifer, about this? Sure. Dr. Simmons, what you've shared can be hard to reconcile with the fact that as Adventists, number 14 of our 28 fundamental beliefs states in part that we are all equal in Christ, who by one spirit has bonded us into one fellowship with him and with one another. We are to serve and be served without partiality or reservation. As you said, discussions about racism and discrimination can be difficult, especially because most of us sincerely believe that we don't hold prejudicial attitudes. However, discrimination and prejudice don't just manifest because of explicit biases that we may hold, but often they manifest because of our implicit biases. Now, hopefully people have heard Dr. David Williams speak earlier today to the issue of implicit bias, but in case some have missed his presentation, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about it now. Implicit biases are attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understandings, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. These biases are activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control, and people aren't aware that they have them. Researchers like those at Harvard through its Project Implicit Initiative and also at the Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity at The Ohio State University have found the following. First, Implicit bias is different from known biases that, every, that an individual may choose to conceal to appear politically correct. Second, implicit biases are pervasive. Everyone possesses them, even people who pride themselves as being impartial, such as judges, teachers, and healthcare workers. Third, our implicit biases don't necessarily align with our declared beliefs or even reflect stances that we would endorse. For example, people who believe that racial profiling is wrong may still implicitly racially profile. Fourth, research has shown that we can hold implicit biases against our own in-group. An individual may hold implicit biases against their own racial or ethnic group that are unknown to the individual holding them. And finally, implicit biases that we have formed can gradually be unlearned. Studies have shown the discriminatory impact that implicit biases can have in a number of areas, including healthcare, education, the legal system, and employment. For example, there are studies which have found that physicians who tested as having pro-white implicit biases were more likely to prescribe painkillers for patients who were white as opposed to patients of color, more likely to refer white patients for needed procedures and follow-up than patients of color, and likely to spend more time with their white patients than patients of color, which could lead to making more informed healthcare decisions for their patients. Research suggests that implicit racial bias of physicians and healthcare workers is a component of the disparities that we see in today's healthcare system. 
In the area of employment, there have been studies that have shown that individuals who are in charge of admissions or hiring and who test high for pro-white implicit biases will rate identical applications differently depending on the gender and race of the applicant, with whites being rated higher than people of color despite the applications being identical. These are just a few examples of how implicit bias can manifest in discriminatory behavior. If everyone has implicit bias, I think we should think about ways this could impact us as Christians as we engage in ministry. For example, could implicit bias impact how we treat visitors who come to our churches? Do all visitors feel equally welcome and included? Does implicit bias impact how we view acceptable worship styles? Have some styles of worship been deemed more appropriate because of our culture and not because they are actually more biblically or spiritually appropriate? Have our biases in the past impacted how we view and represent Jesus? For example, for centuries, Jesus has been depicted as a European. However, we know as students of the Bible that the Jesus we've grown accustomed to seeing through paintings and other media, sometimes even with blonde hair and blue eyes, is probably not close to the real image of Jesus based on the fact that he was a Palestinian Jew. How would a more culturally accurate depiction of Jesus impact our ministry? Now, I don't have the answers to these questions, but I do think this is something that we as a church should look into. The Bible also has something to say about our implicit thoughts and biases. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? As humans, our hearts can deceive us. We don't have the ability to decide whether or not we will have implicit biases, but we do have the ability to try to address the biases that we have. Now, Dr. Simmons, do we have any information about how racism or bias, whether explicit or implicit, has impacted the church and its mission? Recently, a few of us engaged a sociologist and others to conduct a modest informal study of the experience and awareness of racism, tribalism, and nationalism within the Adventist church. The study grew from a discussion at the General Conference about whether uh, there was a need for the church to initiate a more focused discussion about discrimination as experienced within the church. The motivating and driving questions included such questions as, do we have any problems in the church with racism? If not, wonderful. If present, what does it look like? Is it just in one region or more regions of the world? If there is a problem in the church, how is it manifested? The study was conducted at an Adventist university with faculty and graduate students who are mature professional Adventists from all around the world. I'm going to run through the findings very quickly if I can. And perhaps as we go through, our, uh, you can see uh, by a pie chart, just the relationships. Um, first, the respondents were asked to indicate uh, the divisions from which they come. And <clears throat> I am pleased to say that we had participation from all 13 divisions and one special territory of the world church. But moving quickly, the first question had to do with tribalism within the context of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Have you personally experienced tribalism as directed toward you? We find that 45.5% of those who responded said yes. And they made comments about how this racism manifested itself. And perhaps later I'll share more of that if we have time for questions and discussions. But they actually cited instances in which they were told directly that they could not attend certain schools or hold certain positions because of their tribe or caste or race, what have you. The second question dealt with tribalism as well, but it said within the context of the Seventh-day Adventist church, have you observed or heard of a fellow Adventist experience with tribalism directed at them? And you look, you see 66.3% responded yes. And um, 
they shared some of the same, same concerns. The, the next area of questions regarded nationalism. The first, as asking whether or not the individuals have experienced national, nationalism directly themselves. And 57.3 said no, but on the other hand, a hefty 37% said yes. And then whether or not they had ex observed or heard from others that they had experienced nationalism, 48.3% said yes. And then finally, the questions dealt with racism, first toward oneself. And 36%, more than a third of all of the respondents from all of the divisions said yes, they had experienced racism. And then finally, whether or not the respondents had observed or heard of racism against others. And you will note that 58.4% said yes. Racial and ethnic resentment has been declared the number one social problem facing the world and the church. This was stated by Billy Graham, the well-known evangelist some time ago. He went on to say, Tragically, too often in the past, evangelical Christians have turned a blind eye to racism or have been willing to stand aside while others take the lead in racial reconciliation, saying it was not our responsibility. Well, Jennifer, Attorney Woods, with your legal mind, I'm sure you have come to some conclusions in this discussion. I'm wondering, as we look back, what has been the church's response over time and what is the church's response now? Our Savior has called his followers to go and make disciples of all nations. In this regard, Ellen White elaborates, Christ commissioned his disciples to proclaim a faith and worship that would have in it nothing of caste or country, a faith that would be adapted to all people, all nations, all classes of men. In the message entitled The Evidence of Discipleship and the Upward Look, Ellen White issued a solemn warning. She said, I urge all who claim to believe present truth to practice that truth. If they do this, they will have a stronger and more powerful influence for good. The world will see that the love expressed by believers is the central and controlling principle of Christ's followers. She declares the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. She warned, but the dangers from without overwhelming though they seemed, were not so serious as the dangers from within. It was the perversity of his people that brought to the Lord's servant the greatest perplexity and the deepest depression. Ellen White charges us to regard yourselves as missionaries, not among those who are outside the fold, but among your own brethren. Now, Dr. Simmons, recently the General Conference voted on a statement called One Humanity, a human relations statement addressing racism, casteism, tribalism, and ethnocentrism. This it was a very important first step in addressing the issues that um, Ellen White discussed and the issues that we've discussed during this conversation. Can you elaborate on what the statement says? Well, there are some bullet points that I could probably bring out in this time, and I would hope we could engage in a full discussion of that statement at some point. But I think it is significant that we acknowledge as a diverse global church, we are committed to being agents of peace and reconciliation in society by modeling and advocating for the biblical truth about our shared ancestry. We go on to acknowledge that we are to be ambassadors in this divided world with the word of reconciliation. And we say that we will support and nurture those marginalized and mistreated because of their color, caste, tribe, or ethnicity. And we, 
accept and embrace our Christian commitment to live through the power of the Holy Spirit as a church that is just, caring, and loving, grounded on biblical principles. You know, one other piece of that statement that really stood out to me was the piece that says, the Seventh-day Adventist Church acknowledges the important responsibility of making its commitments and compassion clear to a world expecting both words and deeds in harmony with the teachings of Jesus. So with that, we can't end this conversation without talking about some practical next steps that we as a church should take. One of those next steps, one of the first steps should be that the church should appoint one person who has specific responsibility for human relations leadership. Everyone is responsible, but we need somebody who has that responsibility to move it forward. You know, an another step that I think would be really important is that we have a human relations audit to, de to determine the state of our thinking and relationships regarding um, how we treat those from different backgrounds and cultures. Absolutely. And we certainly must also have policy audit because we have looked at systems and institutional operations. So we need policy audits to determine the nature and potential outcomes of current policy. And, and you know, because many of the discriminatory practices that, that we've talked about are based in part on implicit biases and things that we might not even be fully aware of, um, mm -hmm. it would be important for us to have some education and training in these areas. And I think even as we begin with the I Will Go strategic plan, we need specific goals, strategies, and actions to improve human relations. If we have problems, we want to correct them. If we're doing well, we want to continue to grow in grace. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Simmons, for engaging in this conversation um, this afternoon. I know this is just the beginning of ongoing discussions that we as a church should have in the area of race and culture and how our church deals with these issues moving forward. Thank you. Um, I believe the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to preach the everlasting gospel to all nations, tribes, tongues, and people, part of the three angels message. And the gospel or good news is that God loves us. He loves us so much that he gave us Jesus. Um, we've been commissioned by Jesus to make disciples of all nations, but how, how can we share the love of God if we aren't treating all humans with that same love? Um, I know earlier, um, one of the presenters mentioned 1 John 4.20, and I love that scripture. It talks about that if we say that we love God, but we hate our brothers or sisters, then we're, we're liars because we can't love a God that we don't see if we don't love those individuals that we do see. And to me, this in part means that the world is not going to be convinced that we're followers of Christ or that um, we have a message worth listening to about his love for us until we practice the love that we preach. We can't just say that we have love for God without also showing that love through action. Um, in Matthew 25, um, Jesus talks about the separation of the sheep from the goats um, and the measure of who gets to enter the kingdom of heaven is how we treat the least of these. And it's not about how we preach to the least of these. It's how we show love to the least of these in practical ways. Um, Micah 6, 8 talks about that what we've been called to do is to do justice and to love mercy and to, I mean, love mercy and to walk humbly. So, you know, doing justice and, and meeting the needs of society, in my opinion, is part of our commission in preaching um, the gospel and in being, you know, living out the gospel as well. So I think that, um, yes, we have to be concerned with the, the social problems of society today. That's part of what we've been called to do as Christians. Thank you. Dr. Simmons? Yes, I would probably just add a little bit to that because um, this is the mission, as um, Mrs. Woods has said, this is the mission, the three angels' messages. And I think as we have studied, particularly this uh, quarter, our Sabbath school lesson and looking at God's covenant with us, uh, we recognize that the first angel's message is just this. It is about this. It calls us to be 
to recognize and to respect all of God's creation. We worship God as the creator and we love those whom he has created as part of our worship to God. I look at Isaiah uh, 117, and this is pretty direct for me. Learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow. Now, I know some will say that this is only in the spiritual realm, but somehow as I study the Bible from Old Testament to New, and we see how justice is part of God's character, love and justice, grace all together, it appears to me that this is not just in the spiritual realm, but perhaps maybe we should say Since we are Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that the spiritual realm encompasses everything that we do and who we are. So we should be out there. We should be preaching and teaching about this as we do with the health message, as we do with religious liberty. We must um, approach all of these things as Jesus would. And and Jennifer, may I add uh, uh, just a thought? Lately, I've heard so much about this thing about woke or wokeism. I don't know if we need to get caught up in an ideology or or the language of a particular ideology. What I do know is that God's word has said to me that it is high time that we should be awake. Now, whether that's this woke or another woke, God calls us to be awake. Romans 13, 11, I recall. And he says, knowing that the time is night, it is just time for us to get over whatever it is that has held us back to cast off all of these deceptions of Satan and move forward as one united, loving people of God. Thank you so much, Dr. Simmons. And while I have you here, Um, You mentioned uh, in your presentation, the one humanity human relations statement. What was the purpose of this statement and who wrote it? Um, How was it developed? Well, again, quickly, because our time is fleeting. The statement, one humanity, a human relations statement addressing racism, casteism, tribalism, and ethnocentrism. And even as we were working on this, we said we're missing some of the isms, but we I think we're capturing the essence of the intent. This statement is the result of first of all, uh, reviewing our statements of 1985 and 1995 on racism and human relations. And it was clear to us that these should be one statement. There is not something on racism and something else on human relations, but it is one. So we pulled together the thoughts, uh, the concepts that were there. And then we looked at where we are. We studied scripture over time. And this was a a smaller working group that did the primary work, uh, the drafting, the study. And so we studied, we brought it together in draft form. And then we took it through at least four other filters of larger and smaller groups. And practically everyone who chose to had a comment. Everyone was able to deal with individual words, statements, concepts, the entire statement, whatever it was, but we end it with what we have, wanting to acknowledge our responsibility first as the kingdom of God, God's church, and recognizing that the love to which God calls us for each other and for an entire world, every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue, uh, is not just a, a mantra but rather it's the way we live. It is our commitments. And it also called us to step out of our comfort zones. We recognize that it is easy for us to talk among ourselves and to enjoy each other's presence. Even if we don't agree with each other, there's a certain comfort within our group, but we are called to step outside, to be salt in the earth. Jesus said, What good is the salt if it does not mingle? We are called out and called in that say in the same uh, sermon. Jesus called us to be the light of the world, not lights unto ourselves, but light to the world. Thank you so much, Um, Jennifer and Dr. Simmons. We've had a lot of questions about um, the regional conferences and the conference structure here within the United States. Um, 
would you be willing to address that a little bit? Why is this church still organized in this way here in the U.S.? Jennifer? Sure. Um, so, you know, there is a, a history about regional conferences that dates back to the very beginnings of our church. Um, and, you know, our church, again, it was formed during around the time of the Civil War. And, you know, then the Blacks were newly freed. And our church, um, unfortunately, as Dr. Simmons had mentioned and discussed earlier, we, we have a sad history that includes segregation. Our church has not always lived up to the ideals that we proclaim, and it struggled with the same problem of racial discrimination. Um, I, I would encourage everyone to read um, an excellent book by um, Elder Calvin Rock called Protest and Progress, Black Seventh-day Adventist Leadership and the Push for Parity. Um, in that book, he discusses the history of Black Seventh-day Adventism. And also he makes the case of why we now have regional conferences, why they were established. You know, He talks about the fact that they were necessary for the effective ministry um, and for resource allocations toward the Black work. And you know, reading the book, I agree, regional conferences were at that time needed to continue the work among Blacks in the, in the US. Unfortunately, um, we were neglected during that time. Um, as you said, there have been questions about why we still have regional conferences and whether our current conference structure is still needed today. But I'm hopeful that leadership is having or will have um, these conversations looking at our current structure. As I see it, the purpose of a church's organizational structure should be to promote the ministry and the preaching of the of the three angels message. And we need our organization to be structured in a way that enables us to evangelize and minister and reach the unreached the most effectively. I don't know what that new structure should look like, but I do believe it's time that we have a conversation on this. Um, Dr. Simmons, do you have anything to add to, to my comments? Well, you have spoken well, Mrs. Woods. I would, I would um, probably say that we, first of all, recognize that we can not solve this dilemma right here and now. It's not a simple approach to making this change. This is a carryover from our history, just as there are divisive and oppressive carryovers worldwide. We should address this structure, uh, but must do so from a, I would say, from a foundational perspective. We want to totally eradicate the why and then address the how. If we were to restructure, we would need to do just that, to restructure and reorganize, reorganize as a world church, not just shut down Black-led black entities, mm -hmm. uh, which has been the commonly accepted practice of the past. Thank you so much. And I, I know we're coming close to the time. We have um, just about one more question. And this came in from someone and I sort of, I, you know, we loved it. Um, how can we recapture the fervency of our early pioneers to confront and tear down residual prejudice and racism that still exists in the church today? How can we move forward? Maybe I'll start and, and have our yeah. attorney <laughs> some uh, <laughs> official guidance here. Uh, Jennifer and to whomever posed this question, I say we must fall in love with Jesus and his word all over again. Some of you were born in the church. I came in the church through Bible study. I remember how I felt as I discovered the truths of the Bible one Oh, after the other. And I accepted everything. I fell in love with Jesus and with Jesus as the word and with scripture uh, of the word that describes Jesus, that is all about Jesus. I think if we could do perhaps what we did in uh, Kentucky one time in education, we were talking about restructuring the education system. And someone said, let us consider uh, our task as uh, approaching a checkerboard. Let us just wipe up all of the chips or whatever you call those things on the che checkerboard. And then let's put back those that should be retained and then figure out where we have gaps 
and do what is necessary to meet those needs. I think somehow we have been drawn away. We have uh, forgotten our first love. Uh, we are told that we're like Laodicea, like all Christians at this time, we're lukewarm. We need to regain that first love, that heat, that passion for Jesus and for what he calls us to be and to do. If we really love Jesus, we cannot hate each other. If we really believe that Jesus is the son of God, we cannot think either one of us is lesser than the other. We must recognize satanic deception and sin for what they are. I would step up and be the first in the evangelistic pew, not on the platform, but in the pew to be converted all over again, to start fresh and to do all in my power to look like, to be like Jesus. And I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I think it's a heart issue. It's a, a, uh, a conversion issue. I also think that, you know, the one humanity statement was a great first step. And one thing that encourages me is that I've heard that now there are divisions who are looking at how to best reach people groups that have been neglected, right? Um, and I'm hoping that more divisions and more conferences and more unions and more churches and more of us as individuals and small groups have these discussions of knowing our past failings, knowing areas that we could improve, how do we do better? Um, discussion is a, is a great step um, in this process. Well, thank you. Oh yeah, Dr. Simmons, please do. Well, I know we're about to, to go. I, I, I think we need to get past the belief that righteousness and justice are, are not connected mm -hmm. and that righteousness is not doing certain things. God calls us to do and to be um, what he has designed for us. Um, and then um, I, I think I would tie it off by saying we have to be intentional we must be deliberate. This is, this is not going to happen by osmosis. We can pray all day and all night, but just as God told uh, Moses, tell the people to get up off their knees and step out and do something. And you know, he calls us today, pray, pray always, but pray as we go and do and be the people of God.